so we continue with our um, second speaker, which is Nicola Appel. Um, please come on stage. Yeah. <clears throat> Some of you may know Nicola from uh, the bar camp Rhein Main, which uh, she's organizing. Um, not by myself, though. <laughs> yeah, was, uh, part of the organizing team, uh, or the Web Girls uh, is another interesting. Um, you did your yeah. research. Yes, kind of. Kind of. Um, Nicola worked for, worked in, and studied and lived for five years in San Francisco, um, and today she works for a global company, Articulate, um, and uh, they're doing developing tools for uh, e-learning. Uh, and she's, in fact, the only German employee there and uh, never meets her colleagues in real life, I guess, or only once a year, something well, like I'll, that. I'll talk about that. <laughs> on Skype. Um, yeah, and she's uh, telling about her experience uh, in that role. Nicola, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, it was actually quite a change. I, I, was, wor uh, I was used to uh, work at home, being in the home office as a freelancer before for seven years, and actually had made the decision in between not to uh, continue working from home, but being employed again, and having like a, an office to go to, have colleagues to work with and exchange and have that, that creative exchange all together. And then, um, yeah, and then I went to a vacation uh, to the United States. I met some friends, they told me about this job and I was like, this sounds really interesting. I'm, I'm really interested, I wanna check it out. And then this whole digital company thing started, which is actually fascinating. You need to get used to it, but um, I had, in my case, I had five interviews while I was on vacation and later on at home, all online. I mean, I had um, some, some video conferencing. They recorded me so they could uh, show it to their, their superiors and um, made the decision based on that. So I never had a personal um, contact with them, like we never met in person. I signed my contract digitally, so I kind of, there's, there are tools that are verifying that this is actually a legal document, so I, in my case, I had to draw my signature with the mouse. <laughs> Luckily, you can refresh several times because, of course, it doesn't turn out nicely at the, at the first try. So um, that was interesting. And so, yeah, the first time I actually met my, my colleagues was at a conference in London where they flew me in and I was um, supporting them at the booth and presenting the product. So everything um, that I, I do and um, the, the way this whole company works is all digitally. So this is actually something that is actually not, not uncommon in the United States. You have several companies, um, work processes are more flexible, you work from home. Um, yeah, you organize your work yourself, you have more reliability, you need to really make sure um, that the, the work is, is devel uh, developed and delivered and um, yeah, you're, you're really judged and um, paid by what you're doing. It's, um, my American colleagues, for example, they have a work contract where they have no defined vacation time. They have basically unlimited vacation time. But um, yeah, it's up to them when they take it and how they take it responsibly. So this is, I think, especially for Germans, a very uncommon concept because we're very proud that we have all these social standards in our, in our contracts. Um, I have a German contract as well <laughs> because I'm, I, I'm based in, in Germany, so they had to hire me with German law. But I find this quite interesting to see that it's still working, although for us Germans, it seems to be quite an unsecure or unsure concept altogether. So um, just to make this work, actually, the digital business or digital work environment, you need to have an openness for new structures. The structure needs to be set up so that things can work like that. You need to have certain tools that people can exchange with. We do video conferencing once a day, like the team, the whole team meets every day for half an hour, which is called a stand-up meeting. And then we exchange, just give a brief update, what's going on, what do you do, what's the questions, and um, maybe some, some open stuff that needs to be um, clarified. You also need to have a leaner hierarchy. Um, the people are easier to reach. 
I can, I can email, I can chat with my superiors, I can reach them anytime, as long as it's in my time zone. <laughs> so that's, of course, a requirement, and which is quite a challenge, having these team meetings in a, in a time zone that is convenient for all of us. And then also you need to have some training and the competencies to, to work with all the digital tools. And um, so there's really an emphasis on like how uh, familiar, how comfortable do you feel in, in digital media. Um, consistency is actually wrong, so that's for another slide, I'm sorry. That is the, the really um, important part or the point that is supposed to go here was um, you need to, that the, the significance or importance of work in your daily life is actually changing. Like, since you don't really have this, this full schedule from 9 to 5 or 9 to 6 or 9 to 8 or whenever you start and stop working, that doesn't really work any longer, especially since I'm the only German employee. The, there are only two other people in the same time zone for that company. So you need to be a bit more flexible, which is good and bad. I mean, I can start later in the morning. I can take a longer lunch break. It's really depending on like, I need to, of course, organize my schedule depending on what, what um, meetings we have and what appointments we have and what deadlines. But um, yeah, so the whole concept of like, yeah, work-life balance needs to be uh, really reconsidered. Another topic I want to talk about today is e-learning since this is like, uh, the second topic on my, my daily business, basically. So who actually here is interested in working in the e-learning industry or e-learning field? Hands up. Oh, just a few, okay, interesting. So I, I just threw some of the main keywords that are out there right now onto this slide just to show you there's so many buzzwords right now, so many um, strategies, so many uh, methods of delivering learning digitally. So the whole learning, actually, learning industry has changed, has developed, has become digital as well. And um, just reading through all these keywords, are all of them clear to you or is there any, any a term that I need to explain? Just anything? Flipped classroom. Okay, flipped classroom. So classroom is a concept where you basically change when the learner is um, taking in or is working with the content. So flipped classroom is you give the learners or the students the content up front in like little learning um, units like e-learning for example, video learning or something like some, something similar. And later when they come into the classroom, then it's, that's when they start working with the content. So basically the, the learning itself, like the uh, taking in of the content of the knowledge is happening before people can prepare to the classroom and then work together with the content in the classroom. So the concept is that it's a lot more engaging, a lot more interactive, and people are prepared, ideally. <laughs> Doesn't always work, as always, but uh, so that's the concept of a flipped classroom. Collaborative learning or social learning are pretty similar. It's, it's mostly like with the tools nowadays that you can exchange more easily using social media, using chat and, and um, devices like that. You can, you can build groups all over the world and exchange through the media and, and um, yeah, learn a topic. Mobile learning is a real big buzzword right now. Everything starts to be mobile, uh, easy to take with you on a mobile device, and I'm, I'm gonna come to that later on as well. So now, now I have um, a list of six trends that I find quite interesting in that digital learning world, which is, the first one is probably not as new to you any longer, which is M, uh, MOOCs, which is Massive Open Online Courses. It's primarily coming from the university from the universities, and uh, it started when one of the professors put on uh, put his his whole lecture online about artificial intelligence, and he's he's a well-known um, professor, so everyone wanted to see that, and they were quite surprised that he was offering it for free, and it was the whole course, basically the whole class. And the way he was uh, delivering it was he recorded himself and had the slides playing parallel to that. So it was really the lecture online; everyone was able to. Um, subscribe and go through the whole course with them. And he had thousands of people registered. I don't know. I don't even know the exact number. But all the other new universities were surprised, like, 
wow, this actually is great. You get a lot of, a lot of attention for that. It's a great marketing tool for us. So a lot of universities are nowadays jumping onto this trend. And it, I mean, it's been around for some time already, so you've probably uh, you read about it in the news, but now this whole concept of a massive open online course is moving towards the corporate world. So actually larger corporations are discovering it and using it to, for example, reach their customers, doing training open courses for their customers, how to use their tools, for example. So that's also massive, is really reaching a lot of students, open, it's open for everyone, no barriers. Online, of course, and courses is also clear, I think. So most of the time, especially for universities, it's for free. It's recently starting to be discussed if there should be any fee connected to it, because of course, this is also, it needs to be developed, so it, there are some, some costs uh, involved in that, and it can actually be quite expensive, especially with all the equipment and video recording and all that. So that's one of the trends. Microlearning is the second trend that I want to introduce here, and which is also really connected to mobile learning. Mobile learning, small devices, you, oftentimes small uh, screens. So, but microlearning is not micro because of the small screens, but um, it's small units of, of learnings, of e-learning. It's basically, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a snippet of, of whatever you want to deliver. It can be a video, it can be a one-page documentation. Um, so it's really it's getting smaller and smaller, so that people who are really have a uh, who have a busy schedule can just quickly look at it, take in that the information, and then move on. How long can do you think should a video be that until you start being dizzy and cannot really um, follow any longer? How long would be the ideal learning video? What do you think? <laughs> okay, that's the short attention span. <laughs> yeah? Five seconds? It's getting slower and slower. Wow. <laughs> shorter and shorter. Any, there was another? It's actually longer. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I mean, five to seven seconds would be really uh, short. But um, I think the maximum, and if you go to YouTube, for example, most of the training videos have are not more or not are not longer than five minutes. So five minutes should be really the maximum. There are some that are actually longer, but um, good luck with your students. <laughs> you might lose them on the way. Informal learning is also something that I think gains more and more importance. I think especially in Germany, we're really looking on at um, certificates, diplomas, and, and having like a paper that you can show and, and really prove that you you learned all what you learned and you really, did, uh, you know, you have a degree or something at the end. I think nowadays, since all that information is available, informal learning becomes more and more important because you can, it can be easier re reached. You can, everyone can subscribe to a MOOC and all the high level universities, Harvard and MIT and all these um, international universities offer their courses for free. And sometimes you don't even get a certificate, sometimes you can, so that's also something to be paid or not to be paid for. But um, so informal learning ga gains a lot more importance in, in the nowadays. Also, oops, that's the wrong direction. Um, also, the, the role of an instructor, is, uh, instructor is, is changing, especially with open educational resources, OER. Um, which are now available. Everyone is producing content and you have open access to it. You don't have to pay for it. So there are all these online courses, all these materials that you can incorporate into your lessons. And so the instructor is not really the instructor per se, as we know it from before, but it's more like a facilitator or a council, a learning council who is helping you to reach, uh, to, to gain that knowledge that you need. I'm hitting the wrong button all the time, so there you go. This is still also something connected to MOOCs, for example. Your students might not be here any longer. They might not be present. They don't, might not meet locally. They might be abroad. They might be, I don't maybe in, in, in Asia. They might be in, in wherever they, they, they are interested. And whenever they're interested in your topic, they can subscribe to your MOOC, your massive open online course, as long as they understand the language. And so, yeah, you can reach a lot more people, but this also means like the learning structures are a lot more different. You need to have that, you need to be able to facilitate the learning process by having an environment that, that supports it. 
which brings me to learning communities. MOOCs, actually, I don't know if you've heard about uh, the, the two main kinds of MOOCs. One is the X MOOC and one is the C MOOC. C stands for collaborative. So it means that people are working together on a topic. They have blogs, for example, they document what they're learning. And it's not really like one instructor telling them what to do. It's more like they learn together and kind of approach the content through that. For XMOOCs, it's more the, the classical e-learning course. It's a linear, linear course. You have certain materials that you need to um, work through and have a test at a certain defined time um, to prove that you learned what you're supposed to learn. So with learning communities, it's more like an CMOOC, more collaborative. You come, you come together. You can have it locally. You can have it online, wherever and however that works best for you. So um, this is, since we just didn't have that many people in the industry, uh, in the e-learning industry, I just had some tips um, that I thought might be interesting, like how can you develop for an international audience, actually an international program, or in my case, an international e-learning course, what do you need to be aware of? So uh, localization, obviously, is a big, big factor. You need to not only have the language, uh, translated, but you also need to make sure that it delivers the right message to the learners. And um, of course, the main factors are text and pictures. So text is easier because you can translate word by word, but you also need to make sure that you don't um, use pictures, you don't use um, things that are just maybe locally known, like sports, Usually, like in America, people like to use sports <laughs> or, or movie uh, examples. And so that won't necessarily work since not everyone is really up to date with MBA or whatever is going on right now. So um, that's one topic. Of course, political, religious topics need to stay out of the course. So it needs to be really um, neutral on that perspective, really focused on the topic. The other thing is also with the pictures, um, some people, like um, for example, I one, one anecdote from my company, they, they developed, a, they had a picture developed which was supposed to be like a camp and they made the bull's horn, like a sign with a bull's horn to greet people because in the US it's like, hey, high five and whatever, so welcome. Well, you shouldn't do that in Italy, for example, because <laughs> Italians are really, really, they get really, really mad because that's like, well, I don't want to say it now, only since this is recorded, but it's pretty bad, trust me on that. <laughs> so um, these are things you need to consider. So some signs or symbols may have a different meaning for you and other people in other countries and other cultures. Uh, also color use, like white, sometimes it's like for us, it's white as the, the color of joy, of, you know, you get married in, in white. In some countries, it's the, the color of grief. So when someone dies, they wear white. So um, just these little things that you need to be aware of when you d develop your course. So it's usually better to work with local partners uh, just to make sure that you deliver the right message to your learners. Cultural norms is bas basically going into that direction. It's really the image and text, no cultural phrases, and yeah, work with local partners. So actually, I already went into that um, topic. The time zones, that's a challenge. If you're working with someone in Asia, Europe, and the United States, states, maybe in California, then it's really, really difficult to find the same time to make a meeting. I mean, you, some, some of, someone from that whole list will have to make uh, you know, adjustments to their schedule, either get up really early in the morning or uh, stay up late at night so you, you can really get together. And if you're a team lead in an international team like that, you really need to make sure that it's not always the same guy who stays up late or gets up early because they won't like that either. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a logistic, logistic uh, challenge just to get that, um, that going. And also what I find from the meetings with my team is video conferencing really becomes important. Just to see the mimics, to have some personal impression of your colleagues really makes a difference. So um, what we also started to do is have team meetings, local team meetings where we meet from time to time, just to, to get, you know, like besides business, doing business also, have some fun together and then, I don't know, have like normal conversations that you would usually have in, a con in, an, in an office. So that really makes a big difference for the whole atmosphere in the team. 
Well, and the last thing, consistency, you've seen this on the, um, slide number two already, is use a style guide. Come, uh, come up with a, a style guide, also not for visuals, but also for language. What kind of language do you want to deliver? What tone do you want to use? What atmosphere do you want to have in your e-learning course? I mean, this can also be easily um, used for, for website as well. Like, when you localize the website, what message do you want to deliver? And um, yeah, what impression do you want to leave? Yeah, and then also have a quality assurance program, which is really key here because not all translators have the same quality. So um, also local partners come in here very handy again. So that's a, also a good learning that we had. Yeah, and I'm pretty good to my time, actually. So um, this is me. Um, I have a blog where I, where I write an article on e-learning once a week, so feel free to check it out. You can follow me on Twitter under my Nicola Apple account or my professional account, which is articulate underscore DE. And yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Nicola. Do we have any questions? Questions? Too much info. Questions. Too much info. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we learned that there's uh, quite some room for improvement uh, here, especially in uh, digitization, uh, which could be improved in Germany, definitely, and also e-learning. I, I guess there are other parts of the world are much, uh, are much better than, than we here in Germany. Okay.